My name is Nick Wilcox Brown. I am a photographer and a filmmaker. I have also, for my sins, had quite a lot to do with colour management over the years. Uh, so what we're going to do this afternoon is we're actually going to cover two topics. I think some of you probably haven't seen any of the previous CC presentations, Lightroom CC. But what I'm going to do, because the primary title of this is colour management. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of colour management. So we're probably about 10 minutes, I'm guessing. So those of you who want to CC, if you could bear with me on this. But for those of you who want some colour management, we'll go through and explain why colour management is important and a quick overview of how it works. Is that okay? Right, let's just come out of this one and we'll go across into Lightroom CC. Actually, I don't want to be out there. That's, this is what we're talking about, colour management colour charts. Right, what we're going to do is, firstly, we're going to play just a very quick, this is only about 30 seconds, it actually seems a bit long, but let's just play this little video of colour spaces. So we start off with Pro Photo RGB, which is the big colour space that Lightroom and other applications work in as a sort of all-encompassing colour space. So as we come round, this is the camera I tend to use, my favourite EOS 1DX Mark II. You can see, much smaller. And then finally, we come into a fine art print on a sort of watercolour type paper. Look at the difference in spaces or the amount of colour that those things will, will actually project. Right, let's just play this one here, sorry. Right, let's get into this more seriously. Right, Profoto is the the working space, effectively, of Lightroom. It's about the biggest colour space there is in terms of um, devices. And as you can see, this is all the colours that that can contain. If we come into here, we've got that EOS 1DX Mark II, so a fairly high-end stills camera. And you can see that the colour space that all the pictures, colour space basically all the pictures that, that device can capture. Substantially smaller, much weaker in the greens and the blues, and also in the extreme reds, oranges. Now, this is what has always been described over the last 10 years as the photographer's working space, Adobe RGB. And you, in a minute, the reasons for talking about this will become clear. But as you can see, we just flick backwards and forwards, camera and then Adobe RGB. So the camera actually doesn't catch, uh, capture nearly so much in the green and blue areas as Adobe RGB can contain. Now, if we move forward another one, we've got Profoto versus Adobe RGB. And then versus in the middle, the small one is sRGB. This may all sound like names. Some people will understand, some won't. sRGB is typically what your domestic devices will work. TV, basic computer, small compact camera, that's SRB, uh, sRGB. So it's called quite small. Actually, name is S or standard RGB. And as you can see, the shadow, the bigger shadow, is Adobe RGB. <coughs> And there is Adobe and a fine art print. So I'm reiterating this for a reason. This is why we actually use Adobe for printing proper inkjet prints. Not just the quick ones at Boots, but proper inkjet prints, fine art prints. Your work, when it's projected at your camera club or shown at your camera club, you'll typically use Adobe RGB to make sure all your colors actually appear in your prints. Now, this is the reason for all of it. That's sRGB, OK? The big rainbow bit in the middle is sRGB. The red sticky out bits are your fine art print. So if somebody says to me, I can't get my colors to reproduce right, that is the reason right there. sRGB, standard RGB, which we use for films, we use for TV, we use for our basic TV, uh, normal televisions, just literally cannot contain all the color that will appear on your print. So you're actually going to be missing greens and blues. And just another view, quite a lot of greens and blues. So trees, water won't reproduce properly on fine art prints if you actually convert your pictures to sRGB. OK? Does that make some sense? Now, little mission of mine to show off these things. Not this specific device, but this is a good example of it. If you are a photographer and if you have spent 
thousand quid on your camera, you pr or, or more, you probably owe it your to yourself to have something like this, either your own, share it with a camera club, share it with a group of friends, whatever. That is about 150 to 200 pounds, depending on exactly what you buy. It's a screen calibrator. You need to calibrate your screens something between once a week, once a month, depending if it's a LCD, LED type screen, probably once a month will be sufficient. It means that you can see what your look, you can actually see what your photographs look like. You can say, oh, but I've got a nice new screen. But screens aren't calibrated. Screens are too bright, far too bright. Typically an iMac out of the box, just an ordinary iMac, 500 CDM, that's the rate, the units they use as a luminance measurement. If you're working on correcting your images, you should actually be working at 120. It's quite a big difference. So that stuck on your screen, you fire colors at it with the free software, because the software is always free for these things. About 10 minutes work every, every month or something like that. And then when you look at your pictures on your screens, you know exactly what they really look like, not what you think you look like. So if you're a commercial photographer, you owe it to yourself, because when you send your pictures to your clients and they go, the pictures are too dark or the pictures are too bright, you go, well, actually, no, I've got a calibrated screen and they're right. And you can say that with confidence. And going back a few years, I've actually been in a situation where somebody did say to me, your pictures are wrong and we were talking large sums of money. And I said, but I'm calibrated, and I'm properly calibrated. And the problem went away, and it was actually the design house down the line. So if you're a commercial photographer, it can actually be quite important to you. Now, I will just touch very briefly on Lightroom Classic, not Lightroom CC, which is the new one. Lightroom Classic, there's a free plugin from X-Rite who make these. Free plugin, goes in, you can photograph that under normal daylight, you photograph it under tungsten light, not a perfect picture, just a picture of it without reflections, throw them into Lightroom, use the plugin, and it will create a profile for your camera. So instead of going on generic color for your camera, you'll get exact color that your camera can capture and reproduce correctly. So quite useful. If you want one of these things at the moment, and I'm on no commissions, I hasten to add, Color Confidence have got a range of these devices over there, and they make a lot of sense. Now, let me just move on to this. Now, this is not CC. This is very quickly through Photoshop and just explaining something that a lot of people who print their pictures have problems with. Oh, and by the way, if your screen's, if your screen's calibrated, you'll find it much, much easier to get your screen to match the prints or vice versa when you print anything. It really does make it easier. And if you're going to send them off to Loxley or any other color lab, what you see is fairly much what you should get. Now, this is just a quick one in, co in Photoshop. Uh, many people using Photoshop? Yep, quite a few of you. This is a classic. It doesn't happen so often, but it still does. You get this warning up. Somebody else gives you a picture, open it up, or one of the pictures from another camera. What's happening? Leave as is. My, my photograph hasn't got a profile. Profile's a little tiny tag, 10 kilobits, 100 kilobits, to tell the, pic the computer what the picture looks like. And you get this up and you go, oh God, what happens? So the typical reaction is, we'll assign a profile, whatever the computer suggests. And we'll go, okay, and we'll get something like that. Now, I'm not sure how that looks, but actually that's quite garish. That's really not what the picture looks like. Sometimes you have to use your common sense. Does the picture look right, or does it look a bit green, or a bit too bright and saturated? Anyone come across this thing? I'm seeing a few nods here. Right, let me just explain what happens. If you assign a picture, let's just work on something a slight, um, something slightly different. We get a jar of jam, red jam. Okay, it's red jam, it's got no pips in it. What is it, strawberry or raspberry? Well, you look at the label. No label, what is it? Well, of course you can taste it. Not quite the same with the picture. The, the, the color profile, this little tag, tells the computer what jam it is, to use that metaphor. So it's, it's, it's insignificant, but it's actually very significant, because if it's the wrong one and you're allergic to strawberries, you've got a problem. So what we do is we go into Convert to Profile. If you've got a picture and you're not quite sure what it is, you can either do two ways. You can Convert to Profile or you can Assign Profile. 
If you've got a picture that you're not sure about, typically I will assign a profile. I will typically assign sRGB because that's usually what generic pictures are. If they come off the web and they've got no profile, typically they will be sRGB. The question, the trick is then to assign and then to see if it looks right. If it's not, then try assigning Adobe RGB because it'll almost certainly be one of those. Right. That's not tremendously relevant to CC, but I think it hopefully will answer a question that some people will come across. So what I'm going to do on this one, I'm going to assign working RGB, and suddenly we get a picture, and if I just go back a couple of slides, that looks much more, that's, <clears throat> that's wrong, and that's right. I'm not sure how that screen shows, but really, if you look at it on this screen, there's a horrible difference. The first one really is oversaturated, really far too much, even for a temple in a lovely <laughs> golden city. Right, I hope that makes just a little bit of sense. We're now going to go and talk about <clears throat> Lightroom CC. <clears throat> and we'll go there and we'll go into all my photographs. Right. This is Adobe Lightroom CC. Question I've had continuously today, what's the difference between Adobe Lightroom CC and the Lobe Adobe Lightroom Classic CC? Classic is the older version of the software. It works beautifully. It's recently been updated and will continue to be updated. But the new kit on the block has been designed to work with web. It's been designed to work with tablet, phones, even if you're an Apple user, Apple TVs. And I suspect we'll see more platforms that support Lightroom CC. So how does it work? Quite simply, you get your raw camera card or your Wi-Fi, but camera card typically, and you will plug that into your device of choice. I personally prefer plugging it into a desktop machine or an app laptop, but you can get a, use a card reader. You can plug it into your iPad. Android tablet, iPhone, Android phone. You can plug it in, the raw file uploads, and down to your devices comes what's called a smart preview. Smart preview, typically around 10% of the size of the original file, so not data heavy. You then adjust your file in your platform of choice. The changes synchronize to the raw file, which is held in the Adobe Creative Cloud. Raw files are always backed up. You've got a copy of your files on all your devices, and you can edit, rate, flag, pick, whatever you like to do at any point. How does this compare in terms of functionality with Classic? At the moment, functionality is a little bit behind Classic. I would say typically something around, and this is my guess, not, my fi not anyone else's figure, I would say 60 to 70% of the functionality of Lightroom, Lightroom Classic. But it's moving fast, it's being very heavily developed, and it's becoming rather useful. So let me just, that's the overall interface. If I hit the P key or show you my photos, view my photos, there are the photos, all of them. There's a recently added files, files added on certain days, or we can have a look through and see all the dates and whatever the pictures have come from. I've got some albums here which I've created. Albums contain pictures. Folders contain albums, and I can add either here. Now, I've actually got a set here of wildlife images from Scotland. I run wildlife photography and wildlife and landscape photography training courses. I also travel a bit. I also do some commercial photography as well. But this is all about showing off some images. So we'll close that window, and we'll just start to go across here. If I'm synchronizing my images, the synchronize is showed here. If I want to, for instance, find a picture, why don't we go back into that set a moment? Let's just go to all photos in a minute. What I like about this, you can't really do this with the other software. Let's just quickly search. Um, why don't we search Temple? And there are images containing temples. Uh, if we were to go the other way, why don't we search? What do we have just now? Let's go hair. It's a little bit slow. The Wi-Fi is more than patchy here, and there's some hair pictures. So it's got a lovely search functionality built into it. And 
this is getting more powerful. It's using what Adobe call their Sensei technology. So Sensei basically means that they've got many thousands of photographer images. They've scanned them in using machine learning. And it's giving benefits both in terms of the auto color settings, which I'll show you in a moment, and also recognizing subjects. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And it's, it's, working. it's, it's, it's a very nice, easy way to work with things. Right, so let's just grab an image and let's start to actually do some editing, shall we? We'll go for a heron. Heron was shot on a very murky winter's day in northern Scotland about two weeks ago, and it was a very murky winter's day, very cold. So it's not going to be a bright and saturated image, but I'm sure we can make it look a little bit better than this. If I go across here, I go to light, sorry, edit, down here, crop and rotate, healing brush, brush for brushing in local areas to create masks and to isolate areas, layer uh, linear gradients for creating sky grads, ground grads, sea grads, whatever, and then for portraits and things, we've got a lovely radial gradient. So quite nice functionality in here. Let's just do a quick edit on this. I'm going to use the auto button, just brightens it up, makes it look a little bit more interesting. I'll quickly go down to color. Just add a little bit more vibrance to it, and I'm actually not particularly highly. I remember that picture being a lot more sort of bluish. It was a lot more evening lightish. So, <coughs> excuse me. Just give it a little bit more saturation. Maybe that's popping too much. And I quite like to make the sky or the top of the water a bit darker to bring the emphasis onto the, onto the uh, heron. So I'm going to do a linear gradient, drag from the top. Whoops, I've got some presets already on there. Excuse me for that. Let's just zero those very quickly. Better prep required. Right. And we'll just bring those, bring that exposure down. So very quick. Normally, it's, we wouldn't be whoopsie-daisy too much. Just bring a little bit more attention onto the heron. I'm almost finished on this one. I just like to crop it a little bit because it was taking off, and I just grabbed the picture. Heron picture, it's not perfect, but it's looking reasonable. Let's see what else we've got. This is the beast from the east. Let me show you the beast from the east. Some of you may have heard of a filter called Dehaze. Anyone use Dehaze? Yep. So this is actually a perfect application for Dehaze. If I use the auto button on this one, I get a result, but it's not quite what I'm looking for. It's a bit, a bit heavy, really. Not great. But if I come into effects down here, I've got a lovely tool which I use sparingly, very sparingly, called Dehaze. And as you see, I'm just sliding across, and I'm really wanting to reproduce what I saw. I'm not into making surreal sci-fi images. I'm a landscape, I'm a wildlife photographer. I want to recreate what I saw, and sometimes that's a little bit different to reality, but it's not something that's super garish or super extreme. Now, what I would do with that, actually, I'd do, use the Dehaze filter. In fact, I'd use that, I'd actually also use my other favorite tool is curves. So I'm going to pin the top. Did you know you can pin bits of curves so they can't move? Pin the top of the curves, and I'm just then going to take the shadow down a little bit, just a tiny bit, about there. Now, if I hadn't pinned the top of the curve up here, the, the highlights would actually have flexed upwards and made them a little bit brighter, so too much. And again, very quick crop, just to remove the fence at the bottom picture. That's Beast from the East. Possibly could do a little bit more work on it. Uh, in fact, lovely trick on effects. There is another one called Clarity, which sometimes I use and sometimes I don't. It's quite nice for portraits to just take it very subtly in the opposite direction. Makes them a little bit softer, flatters ladies' skin tones a bit better. So we'll just give it a little bit of clarity. Okay, that's Beast from the East. Now, if I want to go in before and after, that's before, that's after. What did that take me? A minute? 30 seconds? works quite nicely. Now we can bring up the uh, browser here. Now let's just quickly show you another image. This is an image that people seem to like. I've had lots of people say, oh, I like that picture. So we'll just hide that one. This is obviously a mountain hare. Mountain hares are rather lovely. They live in the north of Scotland, a few in North Yorkshire, and they just sit in what they call their, what's called their forms. They just sort of stick their bum in the ground and hunker down and hide from golden eagles. But they are actually, if you, if you keep talking to them and approach them very gently, you can get really quite close. 
this one I did wasn't too close to, but I just love it. Decided it was obviously confident because then it's just sitting there. It actually decided to have a bit of a shake. Then it licked its paws and just had a bit of a sort of hunker down and then snuggled down again and ate a few pellets. Do you know they eat their own poo? <laughs> it's a sign they're happy and content. Right, what are we going to do with this picture? Well, I think I'm just going to do a little auto setting to see. That's actually quite nice because the light was blue that is actually how I remember it now if we want something a little bit more correct a little bit more normal in terms of color we could actually instead of using as shot we could use auto and it just makes it a little bit a little bit brighter a little bit more daylightish now I will crop this and I'm going to do a couple of other bits to it I just want to bring it in a little bit but I don't want to lose all the flying snow so I'm going to keep the aspect ratio fairly much the same now again this image I think it could do with a little bit of a little bit of enhancement but very subtle again I can split tone it that's just color tone it I'm gonna push the sh highlights up just a wee bit does anyone use curves are people afraid of curves anyone afraid of curves don't be afraid I know lots of people are curves are a case of just be very very subtle in your adjustments the right hand side is the highlight that side is the shadows you don't want to be right down here because that's the blacks almost so we're up in the mid-tones and we're just going to come below the mid-tones just a little bit and just give it a little bit more if i go too far you see it starts to look quite horrible but if i just move it here i'm bringing the shadows darker highlights up and i'm quite happy with that picture now the only thing we might just do with that very quickly is just do a little bit of clarity a bit more than that because i want to show the flying snow and I want to show the detail. Sharpening anybody? Just short default sharpening or make it look nicer with a bit of proper sharpening. So this is Lightroom CC. It has got some very nice sharpening tools. And if we actually go into that picture, it's actually a little bit too sharp there. So let's just double click and we'll just undo those settings. Right. Now I think we've actually over exceeded our this is if you look at the original image and I haven't got any sync here. If you look at the original image, you can see every single hair on there and it's not blurry like it looks there. So something's gone a little bit wrong, but we'll just work with what we've got. Normally, I'll take, in this, take the sharpening up to about 70, 80, something like that, just to bring the detail out in here. The radius, I'll stick at about 0.7, typically for this camera. And as we're here, we could look at the noise reduction. Now, this is an EOS 1DX Mark II, which is pretty damned incredible in low light. So I think we're on a 1600 ISO. I think it's 1600. Let's have a look. And we're on, oh, we're on 800, so it's not too bad. But 1600 ISO handles with ease. So let's just quickly finish the sharpening. A little bit of noise reduction. That's actually too much. 15 noise reduction, plenty enough. Now, one thing to bear in mind, color noise reduction. What's colour noise reduction all about? Now, typically you'll get texture like this. Now, there's not any colour noise reduction, colour noise in there. Very often you'll get little rainbow patterns on here. And the better the screen, you'll more you'll see of them. So colour noise reduction is really important on making your image look good. But don't use very much of it. Use the minimum, because the more you use, the more detail it takes out of the image. So there's no, no point in paying for a lovely old series prime Canon lens and then doing too much noise reduction because you might as well have a cheap little bottle glass. Right, uh, we'll do that. And now if we had a similar, just I will touch on this. If we had a similar image to this, we could copy those edit settings and we can open the next one and paste those settings across. At the moment, and at this particular moment in time, Lightroom CC does not support batch conversion or batch pasting of to lots of images. You can't do the settings on lots of images. I guess, and I am only guessing because I don't know, I'm guessing that we'll see that in the future, and probably not in a di not too distant future, I hope. But it doesn't do perfect batch conversion at the moment, but it does allow you to copy and then paste settings to other images. Right, we're getting towards the end of this one now. Um, just to touch on geometry, if we've got buildings, let's just do a buildings. Let's go quickly go to a building. Uh, let's go to a building like that one. Right, quick one, not wildlife. Let's just quickly show off the demonstration of the geometry. Geometry, let's have a quick look. Upright. Auto, how does that look? What's going to happen? Well, that's not bad, is it? 
perfectly straight image straight off. What I haven't done at the moment is I haven't done any auto colour correction or auto um, exposure. And suddenly, as the image you recognised from earlier, it looks quite nice. Don't like the edge of the carpet wandering off into the distance. So I'm going to do a very quick, I'm going to save that as a custom and we'll unlock that before we change, try and bring the edge of the carpet up. There we are. And I don't really want to show the fan in the sky there. Down there. Done. Right. That image is basically finished and I will just do again detail quickly just to reemphasize the sharpening. Have a quick look at this guy here. This is a, an M43 camera, an M Micro Four Thirds, so it's not the sharpest thing in the world, but it does give you a reasonable look. There we are, we can see the specs coming up to sharpness. Colour noise reduction, no, a bit of noise reduction because it is a Micro Four Thirds, 15 should do it, and it's looking quite clean. Now, somebody asked me earlier on about masking. Should you mask when sharpening? When you're sharpening an image, you're basically sharpening a radius around a pixel to make an enhanced edge. It makes it look crisp to the eye. Masking actually effectively protects bigger areas of the image. Now, if I can... I've got now an Alt key on. I'm using the Alt key to show you. And the more masking I do, you can see the more areas are being protected from the sharpening. Now, equally, if I go to the sharpening and do the Alt key, it turns it to black and white so you can see how the grain... Can you see the grain coming up there? I'm not sure. Yes, you can. You can see the grain. So typically something like... There we are, about 70, 75. It starts to get noisy and the detail doesn't really increase very much. So a little bit of masking will actually protect some of the image and stop some of the noise appearing in the image. So we've got a cl cleaner looking image. Typically, if I'm going to use masking, I might be using a higher radius, a very slightly higher radius for my sharpening settings. Now, point about sharpening, not just this software, but any software. Typically, if you're going to be outputting files for web use, I would say that the general rule is you want to be around one pixel or under. The smaller the radius, the more detail you're bringing out. So if you want the very finest detail on your cat portrait or dog portrait you want to be down at 0 0.5 0 0.6 0 0.7 radius and then work with a sharpening the percentage to see what looks best typically something up to about 150 percent if you go beyond that really there may be a problem with the image if on the other hand you're a commercial photographer or you want to make a big print for your camera club your clients or whatever typically your sharpening radius will be upwards of a pixel and normally in a rate ratio of sort of 1.5 to 3 pixels if it's going very big on a billboard you might be wanting to go up to 5 or 6 pixels but be wary about that one it's possibly in that case better to let the people who are doing the upsizing and the uh, printing do that sharpening because you never quite know what's going to happen when you interface with their machine and their printers and some of which auto sharpen so general work not not or 0.5 to 1 pixel radius for sharpening something around 75 to 150 percent if you're going upwards bigger scale prints 1 1 to 3 or 1.5 to 3 pixel radius and percentage to suit it hope that may be useful just quickly, I'm going to touch, well, we've got the geometry here. Now, this being a micro four-thirds camera has got the built-in lens profile applied automatically. Nothing you can do about that. If you're using a Canon Nikon Sony camera, you will want to be using these checkboxes. Now, let me just actually, rather than showing you that image, let me just quickly go into an image which is a, let's go to wildlife image because they're Canon. No, that one. <clears throat> what does lens correction do? This is not a great picture, but it's not a bad one. It's shot on a 24 to 70 f 2.8L Mark II Canon, and it will show you what lens correction is doing. We'll go for chromatic aberration. I always do that. Did you see that pop? It's making a change to the geometry. It's correcting for distortion in the lens. If you've got a 14 millimeter or a 16 to 35 millimeter or something similar, you'll see a much bigger change. So lens geometry correction, 99% of the time wants to be done. It will also bring out the uh, hide, the darkening in the corner of an image. Let me just quickly go to uh, that one. Let's go beast from the east. Let me just very quickly apply that again. 
take seconds, worry me a second, let's just go dehaze so you can see it looks right. Sorry about this, do dehaze, and I'll just show that lens correction there, there we are. Right, now let's show me the end lens correction on this one. This is shot on a 24-70 at around, sorry, 7200, so it's a longer lens, and it's an L-series. Strangely, can you just see it's just brightening up the corners very slightly. Some images, this has been stopped down to about f8, so there won't be so much. If you've got your lens wide open, 2.8 or whatever, when you make lens corrections like that, it will typically brighten up the corners quite substantially. So it's something to worth, worth doing. Now, let me just finish off on CC because we're about done. We've got our images, we've imported them, we've put, they've gone up to the cloud, we've done our adjustments on our phone or on our tablets. Image is looking nice, I'm happy with it. We've got a corrected screen, color corrected screen, so we know the colors are right. Final stage is simply an output. At the moment, image limitations, there's, there's a slightly limited range of outputs on CC, but we can go to Facebook if you like to upload to your Facebook profile, or we've got JPEGs, or we've got more in a moment. JPEGs are very, very high quality JPEGs in here. Uh, on a scale of 0 to 12, they're about 14, so they're enormous JPEGs, but they're not badly compressed. You're going to get nice quality out of them. So we can choose to have a JPEG full size, we can have a small, or we can choose a custom file. Typically, long side for social media, 800,000, maybe 1,500 pixels, something like that, so it works quite well. If it's going to a commercial, maybe you want to go full size. This particular piece of software in the desktop does not have the ability to add a watermark. Quite strangely at the moment, if you have an iPad or an Android, I think the Android, Android tablet too, you can add a watermark. No, sorry, you can add it, I think, on Android. On the iPhone, you can output with a watermark, on a simple text watermark. On an iPad, you can't, but I'm sure you will be able to soon. So you can output pictures here, but if you want a watermark, you've actually got to do the output through your phone. And final setting here, which may be applicable to people who want to move images around, original plus settings basically means it's a raw file with the settings. So it's a DNG. So if you like this and it works well for you, but you want to put images back into classic through into Photoshop or something like that, for instance, you may have gone on holiday, put all your images into your iPad, come back, okay, I like these images, I like all the work I've done, but I don't want to waste it output all your images as DNG, so original plus settings. All your masks, all your sharpening, all the keywords you've put in, anything like that, all saved, output them, import them to Lightroom Classic, import them to Photoshop or any other platform of your choice. And the last one I've just mentioned, forgot to mention, keywords. Keywords here, add keywords to it. When you're importing, you can add a batch of keywords. Let's say they're all Scott, they're all Myanmar. Or if you want to, you can add individual keywords to individual images.